fine. Um, so let me, first of all, introduce myself and introduce the project. My name is Wasim Jabi. If you don't know who I am, I'm a professor of uh, computational methods in architecture and also the program lead for the MSc in computational methods and architecture. I've been here since forever, 16 years, I think now. Um, when I came here from Michigan, I, I was I, I did my PhD in Michigan and I worked in New York and I came here. Um, I had an interest in design and computational methods in design. But also when I came here, I found that this school is very, very strong in the area of building performance analysis and you know sustainability and all of that. So I started getting interested in how I can combine uh, building performance analysis with design, with the design process. And in order to do that, we needed better representation. So I was looking at the representations that energy modeling systems need and the kind of representations that architects are producing and BIM systems are producing. And obviously there was this kind of mismatch in the sense that uh, BIM software was producing very detailed, very useful uh, uh, BIM models, but they were um, uh, maybe not compatible uh, as they are with energy analysis. Uh, at the same time, I was interested in visual scripting and in languages of design. And I heard when I was here about Robert Aish, and Robert Aish was somebody who worked at Bentley uh, on, on MicroStation, I believe, and on, on their visual scripting language, and then moved to Autodesk. And there, he uh, they gave him a team. I think it's, it was in Hong Kong or Singapore or somewhere. Disappeared for a few years working on a secret project. And that project turned out to be a new language that is a new programming language that is uh, compatible with how designers think. And it was called Design Script. And Design Script was a, a, a declarative and imperative language, meaning you can declare relationships. You can say, this thing is red, this thing is above this other thing. So it's declarative, but also imperative, like do this thing five times, you know, loop through something five times. He incorporated Design Script inside uh, AutoCAD, actually, not Dynamo. He didn't start with Dynamo, he started with AutoCAD. And he gave a workshop. So I went to that workshop, just listening to what this design script is all about, trying to learn about it, that this workshop was in London. And then I went to another workshop in Cambridge that he was giving as well. In these workshops, at, his, at the end, he mentioned that he's going to bring on uh, Al Fisher from uh, Bureau Happold, and that they're going to talk about uh, something called non-manifold topology. I was like, what is non, this, non, this mathematical concept called non-manifold topology? I did not know anything about it. But he, he mentioned that non-manifold topology is really useful for energy models. And I don't know if he demoed it. I can't remember. But whatever it was, he just mentioned it. It was really, there's not no work done on it. Maybe it was a five-minute uh, demo. So I went up to him after the workshop. We talked. We introduced myself. We introduced himself. And um, I told him that I'm I'm interested in this work. I invited him to, I was writing my book at that time. It was, so it must have been 2013, around that time. I invited him to write a, uh, a, a lasting kind of chapter at the end of the book, which he did, uh, contributed to it. And we started working on uh, using design script to create energy models in, in, auto, in AutoCAD. Unbeknown to me uh, at that time, they were taking design script and they, are, they were incorporating it inside Dynamo. So Dynamo is the visual scripting language that works very well with Revit, and they were incorporating it in there. What happened is that as in the process of doing that, they took the non-manifold features out of design script. They did not expose them to the user. So I could not use them in Dynamo. And they killed off, obviously, the AutoCAD design script Thing because they were focusing on Dynamo. Everybody was using or starting to use Dynamo at that point. So if you go back on, on the online and you search for Wasim Jabi Dynamo team non-manifold, you probably will hit my chat with them, with the team, who's a really nice team. I got I got to know them very well. But this chat was all about guys, non-manifold topology is really important for energy analysis. It's really important for my research. Please bring it in, da, 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 you, know, you, know, you know, asking them to do it. And they're answering, we cannot, technical issues, et cetera. It, actually, in, in reality, it was not a technical issue. It's not computationally expensive or difficult. It was simply a licensing issue. The engine that they were using, they would have to have licensing for that uh, feature to be incorporated, and they, they just did not do it. Giving up on, on that 
possibility happening. I did. I went to 3D Studio Max as a piece of software and found out they had actually bought a small company that does not manifold and I used it, but it had its limitations. It wasn't working really well. I did something. So I went to Robert H., who at that time had left Autodesk and became a visiting professor at the Bartlett at UCL in London. And I said, hey, hey, Robert, you know, these people are not doing it. Let's go ahead and write a proposal to the Leverhulme Trust and maybe we can do an open source, much larger project all around it. He agreed. We went and got um, uh, two distinguished uh, professors to uh, review the application for us and help us with it. One of them was the late Chuck Eastman, who invented the, the term BIM. And we, it was all about redefining BIM. Leverhulme thankfully funded us from 2016. So it took from 2013 to 2016 for it to for this project to to get uh, realized and from 2016 to 2019 I had the the honor to work with this team with Simon Katerina Nicholas and and Robert uh to uh, invent something called topologic and I'll tell you I'll tell you about it in a little bit but so how you know what did we tell the liver home how did we convince them to fund us basically we we told them what the promise was and what the problem is so the promise is that building information modeling uh, offers the advantage of improved collaboration and communication among stakeholders, of course. However, BIM data, as we all know, if you ever dealt with BIM models, they are often incomplete, they're often unstructured, they're often unconnected, they're often ad hoc. By ad hoc, I mean you cannot rely on a standard that that kind of information or that kind of relationship will always be there in that BIM model. Depending on who created it, what software they used, what, how it was transformed, etc., you might, you might not have it. So it's a gamble. And you cannot do your work with 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 in a, in a gambling kind of mode. So BIM was supposed to be also about information modeling, not just building information modeling. Information modeling is it means how you actually represent and structure and communicate information. So that needs to be really part of it, and there needs to be some kind of. Um, more formal ways of representing information. I, I would say that. That shouldn't be, uh, oh, you need this kind of uh, translator or you need to massage the data in some way. There should be some kind of standard and schema for how you uh, model the information and how you communicate the information. So we wanted to somehow, we were obviously a bit naive, a bit ambitious. We wanted to solve these types of problems. We want to come up with an alternative and we were interested in the alternative that is pre-BIM not actually BIM. We wanted BIM to be a, a dependent model rather than uh, a generating model. Like we wanted the model to be just simply something that comes from somewhere else, from some other source. You know, so what is that source? That source would be, you know, in a way would be topologic. So we wanted to redefine or augment BIM using Geometry, topology, and information. And you're going to hear me talk about these three concepts again and again using different uh, a, a different terminology a little bit. Geometry and topology say the same information. I sometimes substitute it with semantics. But we're talking about information. We're talking about knowledge. Okay? So we want to represent buildings as smart and consistent uh, material, topological, informational, and temporal graphs that can be mined for insight and used for analysis and generative design. And, you know, obviously here we have inserted the word graphs a little bit, perhaps prematurely, but we believe that buildings and the knowledge around buildings can be represented formally using a graph structure, a graph made out of nodes and edges that represent relationships. And graphs can be very, very powerful uh, formal means of representation. So what you are seeing here on the right side is, is work we've done over the years with a uh, German company called Ipro Consult. Ipro Consult, uh, and in particular, uh, Ahmed al uh, has we have worked together uh, you know, very, very closely, very intensely for the last few years on uh, converting uh, test fit models. So test fit is a software uh, made in Texas uh, that is meant for developers. It's meant about, you give it a site, you give it some parameters, you say, how many units do I want? And it will give you the economical, commercial value of what you are proposing. Would it work? Would you make your money back? How many units can you sell of different types? And it gives you amazing 3D models and how many parkings, uh, you know, stores and, and, and facilities and amenities. All of that, it models it really, really quickly and produces these admittedly ugly models, but uh, they're not supposed to be architecture. I, I, I have talked with uh, Clifton Harness, the CEO, about it. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we agreed that this is not supposed to be architecture, even though people are taking it too literally, but there's supposed to be the massing of your model, you know, just kind of saying, you know, uh, how much you can fit in. So we've taken these models that are just simply stacks of solids, boxes, boxes all around. And, but because they are uh, built in a certain way, we were able to convert them oh, to uh, topologies that Topologic knows about and build graphs automatically inside of them, classify them, imbue those graphs with information. So it knows this is a unit, this is a corridor, this is a cafeteria, this is a parking deck, et cetera, et cetera. And then convert that automatically to very well-structured Revit models, PIM models, okay? So we wrote that whole kind of workflow together with EPRO Consult, and they deployed it on a 20 million euro uh, student housing project that is now, I think, done. It's, I think it's complete. Uh, and so that's some of the images that you see uh, part of that process and how uh, the fact that you can create Revit models automatically means that you can iterate over the conceptual model very fast. You don't have to create four or five Revit models. You create four or five or 10 uh, conceptual models really quickly, and it automatically creates uh, BIM models that you can then share with your client. You'll notice in these images at the bottom, uh, white lines. Those are like a spider web. That's your graph. That's the graph that is used to represent that building. So what is the methodology behind it that we design? It's succinct, so very, very uh, simple, uh, geometrically simple model, but one that is semantically uh, rich. Uh, then you analyze those models because you can do a lot of analysis on them to ensure quality, efficiency, sustainability, and value. And only when that is done, uh, you can automatically and intelligently convert to fully de detailed BIM models. My students probably heard me say this many, many times. Software is much, much more adept at filling conference rooms with chairs and tables and putting the, the windows at the right place and the right size than humans. We should not be wasting our time detailing and, and populating BIM models. Software should do it. AI should do it. Uh, what we should do is engage in a kind of Vitruvian setting out of the logic of the design. That's what we should spend our time on so that we can have really good quality, analyze that, spend more time on analysis, find out daylight, find out energy analysis, and then allow the software, uh, either based on previous experiences, like, for example, using machine learning to learn from how your office creates buildings, AI, uh, generative, uh, de uh, generative AI, generative design, shape grammars, rule-based systems, whatever have you, in order to convert those conceptual models to, to BIM models. So some use case scenarios where Topologic has already been used, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, EPRO Consult on top, in that case, uh, not only about test fit to, to Revit, but also about classifying uh, rooms uh, in order for them to uh, belong to the same apartment. So basically, if you know about graphs, you know that you can have graph islands. So these are detached gra subgraphs within the graphs. And obviously, every island is an apartment. So if you know where the entrance to the apartment is, and you know that the bedroom is connected to the living room, living room to the, to the bathroom, you, you get a, an island graph. And that island, you can immediately say, that's an apartment. And if that's an apartment, you can color code, you can do your Revit schedules, you can do everything, just simply because now they, you, they belong to the same unit, okay? Um, that, believe it or not, is save them hundreds of hours because there was somebody in the office, probably a junior person, clicking on every room and saying, this is part of apartment one, this is part of apartment two, and doing that on multiple floors of multiple buildings. You can imagine if you're doing it manually, how long that would take, and it's error prone. The other uh, project is in Blender, it's open source. Topologic, by the way, is always open source and free forever. Uh, this is uh, Bruno Possel, who took Topologic, made it the engine behind his software, which is called Homemaker, and in this software, uh, what you can do in Blender is you can make a cube like this. You imagine the cube without those uh, slicing planes. <laughs> then you put slicing planes wherever you want to slice with one click, literally one click. I usually say like, no, nothing in BIM is one click. But in this case, it's literally one button that you press. It creates a fully uh, compliant ISO standard uh, IFC file with all the Windows detail. He likes neoclassical architecture, so he does that. Uh, but it doesn't matter. This is a style that he uses. He, you can switch it over to a modern style. Uh, so he has he has done his job on it. 
inside that IFC model is an energy model ready already embedded based on the cell complex that uh, topology created. Everything is absolutely ready and, and detailed. Uh, and that's kind of was the dream. I mean, when I saw that, we, it kind of like validated what we were doing is that if you have good geometry, but simple, conceptual, because we, we know that as architects, we are setting out really simple, simple geometry, simple uh, uh, relationship. If you have that topologically connected, and then you have embedded in it all the information that is needed, the switch over to a BIM model, fully detailed model is, is breezy. All you need is basically the rules and the tradition mm -hmm. of you as a designer, your language, your architectural language. That's what, that's what you need to add to uh, this type of process. Um, the other thing, you you probably heard me say this before, complexity lasts not first in the sense that uh, I very quickly uh, found out that if I want to do analysis on models, BIM models are the worst for this kind of analysis. If I want to find, exam in this example, a hospital wing where I try to find, does the nurse station see the needed uh, uh, patient rooms, all the doors? Does, can the patients uh, leave in case of a fire? Can they be wheeled out and get to the nearest e egress? All of these types of analysis that you, you need when you're doing something critical as a hospital is actually impeded by a BIM model rather than help. You would think, oh, well, but the BIM model fully detailed has all the information. It has too much information. It, it doesn't have the right kind of information. And it has superfluous information that actually will stand in your way. So basically, it has all the door handles, all the toilet seats, all the cupboards, Right, And you need to remove those because they are slowing down and even crashing your system, pragmatically crashing it, uh, and not allowing you to do this. All the walls, may, they may or may not have center lines, so you cannot create topology very easily, and on and on and on. So basically, uh, I've done this example, I've, not this particular example, I've done a similar example from, a, from an IFC file, where you had to keep peeling and peeling and peeling away in order to get to the conceptual model that was never embedded in the BIM models. And that's the problem with these BIM models is that they do not they they document design geometry, the shape and function and stuff, but they don't document design intent. What was the intention behind this? If you wanted this, your building, uh, just to take a, a simple Palladian example, if you wanted your building to be symmetrical, for example, you know that in your design concept, I have a symmetrical building. Your BIM model will not tell you that it is symmetrical. Your BIM model will tell you there is an object here, there's a room here, and there's a room here. They happen to be the same size. They happen to be kind of reflected on an axis, but there's no way for you to determine symmetry, right? That's not, a, that's not insight, but that's a design intent. If you had that in there, you could maybe talk about it. You could somehow, uh, you know, uh, do some analysis about it. This is what I called at, at the Bartlett a show-off slide, uh, basically to show you um, what topologic and topologic pi have been uh, connected to. Um, the danger, the risk of when I talk about topologic, because topologic is now a very huge piece of software, I usually uh, talk about a sing single aspect of it. <laughs> What happens is that if you're not familiar with topologic, you think, oh, okay, so topology is about energy analysis because I happen to be talking about energy analysis. Or topologic is about space syntax because I showed off the space syntax features like I would do today. Topology is much larger than one thing, okay? It has been connected to all the software, all these systems, whether it is cloud-based uh, victor.ai or speckle, if you know speckle, connecting to Neo4j uh, graph databases, to Open Studio and Energy Plus, obviously, is one of the early implementations uh, to Ladybug and Honeybee tools because we connect to those. It's written in Python uh, on a C++ uh, uh, foundation. Uh, it's been early versions of it were running in Dynamo and in Grasshopper. Uh, we've even uh, connected it to blockchain technology and, and crypto stuff. Uh, it runs in FreeCAD, etc. So just uh, keep an open mind about it because, as I said, it's, it's a large piece of software. But going back to basics, uh, you've heard me talk about manifold and non-manifold, and I promised you that I will uh, explain it to you if you have not heard the term before, if you have, if you have not heard me de describe it before. Very simple. This is not anything big kind of mathematical thing. We don't go into the, the big kind of set theory or topology spaces or whatever. I deal with it in a, in a very simple way. Most modern engines 
uh, rendering engines, uh, CAD engines, 3D modeling engines, like what Auto AutoCAD would use, what 3D Max would use, what Maya would use, what uh, Rhino would use, usually can be classified into either manifold engines or non-manifold engines, meaning they're either dealing with solids, polyhedra, and, and you know something like that, or they're dealing with this kind of a uh, strange hybrid where you can have a solid, but it can have internal faces, internal subdivisions, okay? So where does the word manifold and non-manifold come from? Manifold is really shortened for two manifold, just the number two, two manifolds. And non-manifold is anything that is mo more or less than two, one manifold or three or more manifolds. And I'll tell you what manifolds are. Replace the word manifold with set, with a set. Okay, and imagine that this cube that you see on the left side, right, is a solid cube made out of wood, and it is a set. It it has a boundary, and it separates that boundary from the outside world. Now, the outside world can have subsets. There are other buildings, there are other countries, there are trees, etc. But think about the outside world. According to this cube, you're either in it or you're out of it. Right? There's no other solution to it. There's not, you're either inside or not. So imagine yourself being a point where that arrow is, imagine yourself being a point on that on that surface of that cube. And you're looking around you, right? Your, wor your worldview is limited, you're a point, and you're looking around. So you look one side and you see timber, you see like some kind of species of timber. You look on the other side, you see the whole world, the, everything else, you don't see anything else. So your world is made out of these two sets, right? Now, let's switch over to the cube on the right side. Imagine again, you are that point where the arrow is pointing, that middle point. But this cube is has zero thickness surfaces, let's say, has interior surfaces and has spaces inside of it, right? How many spaces does it have? How many spaces does this one have? Eight? Eight spaces, four on top, four at the bottom. Okay, so let's go back to that point. So you're again looking around, right? How many sets do you see? Hmm? Five. What are they? And the, and the outside world. Five. So that is called a five manifold. If I picked another one, let's say if I pick, I don't know if you can see my mouse, if I pick this one here, this would be a three manifold, right? Two cubes and the outside world. Anything that is not two is called a non-manifold entity. Okay. Why is this important for us? Because these types of models are exactly what energy analysis needs. That's how we started with all of this. Because energy analysis is all about topology. It's all about how much of a surface, you know, uh, separates this room from the room next to it. I multiply the surface by the U value. I can I can compute my energy transfer. I can do all everything else. I actually don't need a lot of detail. I just need surfaces. I need to, to know topology, what is next to each other. Behind the scenes, energy uh, engines are actually using a topological model. So these types of representations are really, really, really important. But first, let's go back even um, to, to first concepts, as we call it. So this is a board game. Uh, this was excavated in Harappa, I think in Punjab and in, in Pakistan. It was dated to 3300 BC. And if you look at it, it's kind of a precursor to chess, right? And it has pieces, it has uh, a grid, and these pieces obviously will move in a certain way. The pieces are different, uh, have different roles, different different shapes to them. Uh, again, from, from India, this is uh, the deities Krishna and Radha playing Shaturanga. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. Uh, it, in Persian, it would be Shatranj. In Arabic, it would be Shatranj as well. That's the word we know. It's for chess, words for chess on an eight by eight uh, board. So what about this, this chess thing? Why am I talking about it? Basically, there's something called the knight's tour. The knight is the one that looks like a horse, right? That, that chess piece. But it's actually a knight riding on a horse. So the knight moves in a very peculiar way, right? It moves two over and one over. So the question is, if I put this knight at a certain initial location and then I move it the same way it's supposed to move, can I visit all the squares on a chessboard only once? And I can, can I cover them all, right? So you can see here, one, two, three, four. Can I keep moving it that way? And by doing that and keep doing that, can I cover the whole chessboard 
And can I also not ever visit something uh, a second time? Okay, so that is uh, the, the challenge. In graph theory, this is called a Hamiltonian path after uh, William Rowan Hamilton. But in fact, he was not the one who invented it. He's not. The, he's the one who formalized it. But actually, it was uh, talked about, earliest talked about by uh, Rudrata, who is a poet. He's an Indian poet. And at the same time, also in Islamic mathematics by <laughs> Al-Adli al-Rumi. It turns out that, yes, you can do that. But let's talk about uh, Rudrata and how... How how does poetry and the linguistic model become a mathematical model? So what did Rudrata do? Rudrata was, again, like many poets uh, in that period, was trying to show off. He was trying to uh, show his abilities. So what did he do? He invented this two-verse poem where the first verse is written, all the syllabi of the first verse, are written in squares, eight by four, so half a chessboard, first of all, not a full chessboard. So the first verse syllables are placed in boards. The second verse, the syllables, the syllables of the second verse are the knight's tour along those uh, uh, first syllables, okay? So basically you write them eight by four, and then you put your knight and you move it according to a knight's tour. It visits all of them. And that creates the second verse of your poem. So it all came. I, I love that because, it, as I said, it comes from uh, you know dealing with language, but obviously placing it uh, in, in a in a kind of geometric and topological world. But by placing it in a topological and geometric world and having a poem, you're adding also semantics. All of these things are coexisting in the same device or world or set or whatever you want to call it, same context. Geometry, topology, and semantics all coexisting in the same place, right? So what does that have to do with topologic? If I showed you a chessboard like this, but I did not tell you a chessboard, you don't know chess, you don't know about game boards at all, nothing. You know nothing about except you accept geometry. You will treat this as geometry. I say describe it. You will tell me it's a square. It has inside of it another square. This other square is, is divided into 64 black and white squares, right? You will describe it geometrically. That's that's where we would stop. But if I tell you, oh, by the way, this is a kind of a, a board where you can move on it in a certain way. And only if they are connected in a certain way, you know, you can move X amount here in the Y, in the X, etc., And you can start talking about how things are connected and, and you start feeling that this, this black square is connected to this white square, this white square is connected to this black square. When I, we talk about connections, we're talking about topology. So we're added now another layer beyond geometry. We're talking about how these things are connected and how you can traverse that world. How long does it take you to go from here to the, end, to the entrance of this building, to exit it? What kind of spaces do you go through? This is topology, right? But if I tell you, we're going to put chess pieces on it, and they're going to look like a horse, but it's actually a knight, and there's a king, and there's a queen. Where does that come from? That's all information and semantics. Some other culture might not put, might not have horses, might not have never had horses, might have goats or whatever have you. So they, the semantic layering that you are putting onto it is another third layer. It's a completely different one. So you have geometry, topology, and semantics, and that's what topologic has. We've, I've looked up, I wanted to invent a name for it, so I've looked up, did my homework, could not find a nice, like, succinct name, but finally found one. It's a word that does not ex exist in the Oxford Dictionary, but it is used by biologists. And it's, the word is syntopy. Now, syntopy is used when different species exist and kind of help each other in a symbiotic way in the same location. Um, this happens usually at a cellular level or insect level, etc. But even like you've seen those uh, pictures of the bird picking off the teeth of the alligator, right? They kind of exist in the same location. It's more involved than that, I believe. It's more about inhabiting uh, the same the same thing. It's it's it relates to sympathetic. Uh, uh, it's a form of sympathetic uh, coexistence. But syntope comes from the Greek, obviously, syn co. Topos, uh, location, co-location, uh, syntopismos is the Greek word for it, if anybody knows Greek. 
So how does this work in topologic? So now we get more into the uh, topologic um, details. Uh, topologic pi, which is the Python version of topologic, uses non-manifold geometry to represent conceptual models with full adjacency and topological rigor. It balances a simplified geometric model with deep topological information and semantics. Specifically, it stores topological, scalar, textual, logical, and compound information at several levels of the topology. Behind the scenes, topologic pi builds a builds primary and dual graphs. I'll, I'll tell you what the difference is of topological entities that enable spatial and performance analysis. So this L-shaped, I'm going to call it building. Now I'm already putting a semantic layer on it. I'm saying it's a building. It is geometrically simple. It's abstracted. It has a graph in it. That's the wire and the little red dots that you see in the middle of it. So that gets built automatically. You don't have to worry about it as long as you build a cell complex. It gives you that. You can customize it. It also has um, uh, red colors, yellow, orange colors, yellow colors, blue colors. Those are uh, topologically computed. Basically, it's a if you know about space syntax, this is a centrality measure. How far are you to other spaces in the building? How far? How how many connections you have, you need to jump through in order to get from one space to the other? You calculate it and you uh, encode it as a color. And the reason we can do that very easily in topologic is because I have a graph and I can traverse the graph and I can count how many how many stops I can find shortest paths and I can find Hamiltonian paths and stuff like that. In topologic, you have something called decompos decompositional topology in the sense that if I have a complex object, like a cell complex, as we see up there, I can ask it very directly, please give me your cells. It will give me eight cells. Please give me your faces. It will give me however faces they are, uh, edges, vertices, etc. So you can climb down the tree from more complex objects to simpler objects. That's called decompositional. But you have also the reverse. You have compositional topology, which you do not usually find in other uh, engines, which is I can take a certain vertex in that cell complex, one vertex, and say, how many cells use you? What, what cells are you part of? And it will tell me that. How many faces use you? I can take an edge and how many faces use you, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So you can climb up the tree um, in, a, in a reverse way. And that is the power of topology. It's not just that I can subdivide. Anybody can subdivide. We've, uh, we've seen like in Rhino and stuff like that, you can subdivide things into its components. But this one also allows you to climb up the tree. This is compositional. Uh, obviously, behind the scenes is graphs. These are examples of uh, flattened graphs you can have from uh, from topologic very in one click. You can flatten a graph using a tree structure or spring or radial structure. So graphs are... Uh, always there, always kind of at, at your fingertip if you need them. Uh, graphs can be customized by connecting additional entities. So not only do we go space to space, we can go, we can say, okay, I have this room. I want to represent it by its dual graph. So a space becomes a vertex, okay? And whatever information you have put in for the room, like what carpets, what the, the volume is, whatever, uh, energy performance, cooling loads, heating loads, all that information gets zoomed in and compressed in that one vertex. So you take the dictionary that is assigned to the space and that gets embedded inside that vertex. So the vertex becomes a representation of the room. But not only that, you can say, okay, I have this vertex in the center of the room. I also would like you to draw an edge to the windows. So I will get three edges and the nodes on the windows will inherit the dictionary of the window. Who's the manufacturer, U value, area, glass type, whatever have you, you know, material type. So now all of a sudden, I can go from the window to the room, to the door, to the corridor, to the other doors in the corridor, to other rooms, right? So I can, I can connect more information and represent my building in a more rich way. This is called the dual graph, okay? That is the dual graph. It's not the actual geometry. It is the representation of the geometry by uh, reducing dimensionality, okay? So it's a surface becomes a vertex, a space becomes a, a, a certain vertex. The primary graph would be where the nodes are actually the corners of the shape and the edges are the edges of the shape. That's the primary, it's the same thing. It's almost like the geometry of it. We could, we could take the geometry of this and say, make me a graph out of it, if, if that is useful to you. But that means the corners of the room are the nodes, but the actual room does not have a node. 
and that is might not be useful to you. So you can connect to apertures like windows and doors. You can connect to exterior topologies. You can connect to interior topologies because usually in a dual graph, when you have a surface uh, separating two adjacent spaces, it's, it's a relationship, right? So it's an edge. An edge represents a relationship. But if you want to represent the wall and capture the information, you can put a node on it. So it goes room to wall, wall to room, rather than room to room. Okay, so you can add another node there. <laughs> you can connect to the contents. So for example, if we want to capture that this room has these tables and these chairs, each one of them will get a vertex. And from the room vertex, I can connect to all of those and then uh, go over to the, to the other rooms. So you can definitely uh, connect to contents. You can also connect to remote, unconnected, geometrically unconnected entities, simply because you, you have an interest in them. Like for example, if you want to say, I want to connect all the desks that are of a similar manufacturer or similar size to each other, you can do that. You can say this desk is connected to this one, but it's also connected to, to another one in a different room, simply by the ID uh, of that. And you can build that graph. So you can ask about, you know, how many of these desks do we have in this building, right? You know, rather than going counting, it will go from here and start traveling along, along the graph to find that, that answer. There's something called uh, lateral topology. I've already talked about it in the sense that in this sense, uh, it is kind of uh, neighbors, if you want to talk about neighbors. So in this cell complex, I selected one cell, one room, which is represented in red. And I said, give me your adjacent cells, give me your neighbors. And all of those are represented in yellow. So you can see based on what you are selecting, it will give you the set of uh, adjacent uh, topologies. But also you can do uh, adjacency through um, kind of going through and finding out the shortest path. So that could be an adjacent. If you want to say, is this room adjacent to the other one? Doesn't mean that it's geometrically adjacent. It means, can I get there really quickly? So that is shortest path. You can build things called minimum spanning trees. Uh, and you can see, that, again, which is really nice and topologic and topologic pi. You can take that uh, graph, which is a minimum spanning tree, three-dimensional, and you can flatten it to make sure that it is actually a tree. And it's really nice to, to represent it sometimes in 2D. Um, a minimum spanning tree allows you to connect what needs to be connected, what used to be connected, without cycles, without any kind of redundant edges that you don't need. So it's a tree. And that is very useful for uh, efficiencies and finding whether you can go from one place to the other without having to go through cycles. Uh, so, as I said, you can have lateral uh, topology. Uh, in this case, uh, we're doing shortest path from one room to another room in 3D. And because of that, we can do uh, really nice graphics in topologic because you can do closeness centrality. So you can do space syntax metrics. You can do betweenness centrality. You can look those up. Basically, betweenness centrality is like threaded paths in a park, right? When you walk, when you put a park all in grass and people walk on it, and then you get the threaded paths. That's what betweenness centrality. You do shortest paths, and you count how many times does a vertex get traversed. And the more it gets reversed, the warmer color it gets or the higher number it gets. So you can very quickly find out, you know, if we let loose certain agents in a space and they're moving around, where do they walk? Where do they go? And you can find out the ones that are most traveled. Maybe that's where you put your things that you want to sell or the most famous painting you want to put it there or, or the water fountain because people are going to be passing by it, et cetera, et cetera. It's really useful. We can also do visibility graphs. So visibility graphs is about what you can see from one point to the other point. So basically, it's a, it's a nice geometric uh, problem where you say, I have a boundary, I have some obstacles, I have eyes, and I have targets. I have sources and targets, right? And then you uh, shoot rays, and these rays uh, kind of uh, get intersected by the obstacles, and you find, uh, basically, you start counting how many things I was able to see from this one point view, right? If I count, like, if you are the target, how many people can you see? And how you know, everybody probably can see everybody else. So we are all equal in that. But if somebody is hidden under the table, nobody can see them, but they can see everybody, right? You can you can compute that kind of visibility. So topologic pi can compute visibility graphs and map it and interpolate the value. So in this case, the, the warmer colors, I believe, are high visibility and the darker colors are low visibility. So we get to graph machine learning really quickly, and I know we have only 15 minutes left. Uh, so graph machine learning is basically a type of AI that focuses on understanding and making predictions about data that's organized in a network of, of graphs. 
the challenge between is in graphs is that every graph has a different structure, different number of vertices, no different number of edges. It's not like uh, doing machine learning on vectors where you have a table in Excel, for example, and all the columns are exactly the same length, right? Graphs are different. So how do you, how do you predict uh, what a graph is? So people have invented uh, uh, software tools uh, to deal with it. And we, anyway, this is from the work of Abdurrahman Yamani, who's, who was my ex PhD student. Now he's a lecturer at Al Faisal University. A dissatisfaction with image based approaches, but also with uh, normal, um, traditional neural network approaches. Uh, we decided that we really cannot tell what a building is by just looking at it from the outside. Because we don't know what's going on in the inside. We don't know what's going on on the other side of it. We need a lot of images. You know, does it have a, even a water tank up on top? Does it have a basement? We don't we don't know that from, from an exterior image. But a lot of people are trying to predict uh, the class of a building based on or the typology from, from images. And, uh, you know, with some success, with some failure. But if we have the graph of it, we can uh, make kind of predictions. We can make predictions at the graph level saying, that looks like a hospital, or that looks like a library, or that looks like a museum. Or we can make a prediction on the node level saying that looks like a living room, that looks like a conference room because it's connected to certain other spaces that we know from our training, conference rooms are connected to. So we can make a prediction at the node level. We can also make a prediction on the uh, linkage saying, oh, this is a conference room and that's a breakout room. They should be connected. There should be a door between them, right? So if there isn't a door in your BIM model, maybe you should put a door, right? You should put a, an edge. So link prediction is, is to predict whether two things should be linked or not. You've all used graph machine learning. If you ever bought anything from Amazon, if you ever gone on Facebook or Insta or whatever have you, it's all based on graphs, what you are connected to. You buy one thing, all of a sudden it's suggesting a million other related things, and those are all related by, by graphs. All right. So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of, you know, you could, you could find this online, obviously, uh, how training of neural networks work. Graph machine learning uses convolutional layers and training and neural networks exactly like other stuff, but it's it's in the transformation of the data into something that can be compatible with neural networks is where the trick is, is where the challenge is. But forward propagation, backward propagation works exactly the same way. So what we did in uh, Topologic and Topologic Pi is that we connected, we integrated uh, a library called DGL, which is based on PyTorch, uh, deep graph learning. Uh, which allows us to do uh, graph classification, gra graph regression, node classification, node regression, which is in you know in process. But basically, we take uh, a, a, a model of some sort, a building like this. We derive its graph, its dual graph. We classify. You see, these nodes are color coded, so they are classified. Building in this case, like it would be building, plinth, column, ground, something like that. And we convert that, we output that to a series of CSV files that DGL needs. And we run our training, hyperparameter optimization, epochs, all of that that is needed in order to run DGL and classify, classify that graph. Okay. So this is some, you know, it gets a bit geeky here. That's all the uh, Python code. I have Jupyter notebooks that are available on GitHub. Everything is available if you'd like to test it out. But basically, you start optimizing the hyperparameters. And you need to discover the correct hyperparameters for this network to start predicting correctly, but not also overfit. Because you can learn, if you learn somebody, if you give somebody library, 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 it will learn that what a library is, but will never know what a museum is or will never know what a hospital is, right? So there's a different kind of generalization that is needed. Um, so you need to learn, but without overfitting. But there are a lot of... Uh, uh, hyperparameters like how fast do you want it to learn the topology of or the you know, the shape and the topology of the neural network itself. It's a, there's a lot of really complex uh, hyperparameters, and you can search through them, and you can you can find the the best set, and then you go and train your your network, and then you test it. You test it on unseen data. What we have done is not only did we test it on unseen data, which is fine, you know, it it performed really well. 94, 96%, something like that, accuracy. We also try to trick it. So we basically, we trained it on buildings that have one core, one vertical core. We gave it buildings with two cores or three cores. Uh, one tower, we gave it like three, four towers connected to each other. 
and we, it still performed well. That means it can at least generalize a little bit. We did not give it, like if we are giving it buildings like that, we did not give it parks or something else. Like we did not, you know, dogs and cars. Like, no, we, it has to be within the realm of architecture, right? But within that, it, it performed really well. So we conducted a workshop. I'm not going to uh, bore you with this one, but basically we started by building a synthetic data set uh, in Grasshopper. We moved it to Jupyter Notebook, Topologic Pi. We ran it. Uh, it's based, as I said, on um, the relationship between building and ground. That's what we were trying to classify. Does the building hover? Does it sit onto the ground? Is it interlocked with the ground? It comes from kind of a landscape architecture type of uh, part. This is just a uh, peak view of the, uh, the synthetic data set. This is, I think he built 1,496 synthetic buildings. These are abstract, simple buildings that look like this. Um, we built the graphs out of them automatically. We created the Excel spreadsheets automatically. We trained the neural network. We tested it, unseen data, it's all of that. And the what we were trying to classify are these five uh, categories, whether it's separation, separation with a plinth, adherence, adherence with a plinth or interlock. Um, and we conducted a, an a Acadia workshop recently. Uh, it was attended by about 30 people. And these are the what the applicants and what the uh, workshop um, attendees sent us uh, as files. So they use topologic pi. In this case, uh, this guy wanted to do uh, Epcot Center type of thing, trying to see what we've never done a sphere or anything like that. It predicted it correctly as separation, as you can see here, because it's separated from the ground. Uh, other models from the participants, uh, in this case, we were wondering whether it's going to be interlock or, or separation. It predicted to be separation with plinth, it's 94% accurate. So you're going to have 6% errors, obviously, you know. So, uh, and sometimes things are not clear cut. You know, what, what is this? Is this interlocked with the landscape or is it separation on a plinth? Et Some other uh, parts of my projects. One more. Um, just to kind of conclude, uh, I'm, not, I'm going to skip this one, uh, but basically I just want to say, what we suffer from in the AEC industry is, uh, unlike the software industry, we don't like to share. And we don't have data sets to train because neural networks and machine learning need huge amounts of data. And that's a huge problem that we have here. Issues of IP, client confidentiality, even pride sometimes. They don't want people to know whether their design is good or bad. They don't want eyes closed. They don't want to hear about it. Um, these, these are issues that we, ha we have to deal with. So we are resorting to a lot of building synthetic data sets. These are completely, you know, um, artificial, uh, digital, but we really need real data sets. Okay. But I really, after all these years of doing this, really believe that graphs are very, very powerful, uh, representational tools. We should always try to uh, build them and embed them and keep them in inside the models, because I think we can use them later on to, to very good effect. So I asked ChatGPT, as you all do when you submit papers to me, my students I'm talking to, you shouldn't. Uh, but I went and had, I said, okay, what I said, asked ChatGPT, what do you think of topology? And it said, topology delves into the intrinsic nature of spaces, emphasizing that true that the true depth of our world goes beyond surface level shapes. It reveals the intricate uh, web of connections and boundaries, serving as a reminder that reality is not solely defined by tangible forms, but also by the intricate interplay of relationships between them. I thought, pretty good for, <laughs> much better than how I would express it, but definitely uh, really good uh, as, as an ex example of topology. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, guys. I'm happy to take a few questions in the last six minutes if anybody has any burning questions. And also from the uh, Zoom people. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any any questions? Yeah. Okay. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I was for a person. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Value and ethics. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm going to ask a quick question. Yeah. And really, it kind of a bit in the summary of the sharing of information and data. Yeah. Because we're in terms of the end of the analysis of um, quality, efficiency, sustainability, and value. Yeah. And what I was wondering is, um, because it's so detailed and so thorough, and going back to the open up the black box kind of thing, is what, what are the what are the measures in those four areas? What kind of data? And how, how do you feel about the measures and what kind of data? Yeah. The, the metrics on those. So uh, a couple of things, and and I think I think you touch on on a really important uh, issue that uh, from a technical point of view you can very easily ignore it, which is to say that after after talking about yes we need sharing and we need uh, we need this this type of transparency, we are running it through a a black box model which is the neural network. Even people far far smarter than I am who are computer scientists don't know how it works and how it predicts things and why does it do one thing and not the other thing. So there is that kind of uh, ethical issue. There are a lot of, re- there's a lot of kind of nascent research into making these transparent, explainable AI, I, I think it's called. Uh, I'm not I'm not an expert in that, so I can't comment on it. But definitely I think that it is needed uh, before you start using any kind of system that is going to make a judgment you need to understand how it's making a judgment and whether that judgment is, and how how do you view that judgment, okay? Um, Beyond that, um, it is about allowing the AI to actually, even if it's a black box, how does it make, what kind of judgments do you want it to make, right? Uh, Good or bad, right? Is Is it really allowed to say this building is good and bad, does it even know, is it qualified? to say whether it's good or bad. So you need to be very, very careful about that. Uh, we've done things like, in this case, uh, predicting the, the relationship between building and ground. We don't say that this relationship is good or bad. You can make you can make that your own judgment about it, but it's telling you what you're designing looks like it's an interlock. We've done another system where it is predicting the energy performance. So it's a surrogate model where it's predicting the cooling loads and the heating loads. Again, the judgment is up to the designer to say, yeah, this is what I'm expecting or or not expecting. What you have trained it on is also important because if you are an architectural office and you are training it on how you do things, it is the value of what it's saying is relevant to your own experience and your own context. Doesn't mean that this neural network and this model, the surrogate model is appropriate for anybody else. So uh, sharing of neural neural networks is going to be problematic. I don't believe we should share them unless we know what we are sharing, why, what they are applicable to. Yeah. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, let me just, I'm going to open up the chat just to see, just keep it. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you're on my side here. It's really interesting. Yes. Yes. Um, um, the original idea of space syntax was trying to understand how the spatial configuration is affected or affected or affected, affecting the social relationship. Correct. Fundamental in terms of the the way in which building operates and cities operate. Um, is there a way to bring in machine learning to try and understand the social relationships, say, for example, with this building? Uh, when I say social relationship, it could be work network or hierarchy that comes within the organization, etc. Is there a way to spend machine learning that very important to train uh, the buildings to, to learn from how we are operating to right. generate better efficiencies in terms of layout, not just from the kind of performance of the sure. components, but to go back to the original light of space. Of course, right. of course. So I'm just I'm just going to repeat it or summarize it. I hope I don't do it injustice just for the, for Zoom. Basically, can machine learning uh, comment on or, or help us uh, with uh, analysis of how buildings perform socially and, and performatively in terms of how people use them, user behavior and all of that? Um, 
obviously, something like topologic pi can build graphs that are uh, can relate to space syntax metrics, like visibility graphs, like degree, like all of that. I hope. <gasps> Oh yeah, okay, yeah. We're, we should. We should, this should be that. Can I have two minutes? Yeah. Yeah, two minutes. And um, so the first step would be to go. I mean, obviously, the first step is to go back to the space syntax uh, analysis that you are doing and make sure that it is valid and verified, so that it does. There is a relationship between the metric that you are seeing and measuring and the actual user behavior, because that's always a problem with space syntax. Like you know, yeah, it, it says that. People are going to go that way. I mean, I, I remember attending Bill Hilliard's talk in, in Michigan and I asked him the question, okay, you're doing that analysis on a flat city and you can tell me, but if it is San Francisco, people are not going to go up, at the, up the hill. So the third dimension was not kind of included in that time. It was early days. So validation of, of that. Once you have validation, then you have, you have space syntax as a surrogate model for user behavior. And then you can have machine learning as a surrogate model for space syntax analysis, which we can do and we've done. So I think you can go through th those two steps and comment on very quickly get results, very much like we get surrogate models for energy analysis, you can get results on uh, so what I'm thinking is like, for example, we take all the units here. So there is, there is like a design way in which this building is supposed Operate. Yeah. Um, space and that can probably predict movements. <coughs> Accessibility yeah. movements. Yeah. 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 So VGA graphs yeah. can give you a certain amount of uh, social nature of the program. But how do they operate is, or how do they actually work, also depends on the organization environment, the organization. Sure. Uh, things like how, sure. what clusters sure. of research. Are. Yeah. So, yeah. So, is there a way in which we can? take many of these buildings and try to kind of um, you know, learn from how people behave and then go back and refine yeah. the space syntax algorithm to make a better prediction so that is there a way in which we can make these corridors work better? Right. I think I think what you are talking about requires uh, both the the graphs, the metric graphs, but also knowledge graphs. About, yeah. about how the organization is structured and how does it operate. And by combining these layers of graphs together. Three things. Yeah, okay. Tell me, the, the, tell me the three graphs because I think it's important for... for the, the, first is the, the spatial network. Yeah, that's okay. good. Organizational network. So, behavior. Behavioral networks. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, that's a really interesting research project. I think we should we should talk about that. We gotta go. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone on Zoom. Bye bye.